Hello everybody and welcome back to the ASUS North America YouTube channel. It's JJ once again and we're bringing you guys some content that you guys have been asking for us uh, for quite some time and that is a new overclocking guide. Um, this is one that's going to be specific to the brand new Z87 based chipset and specifically for the fourth generation series core series processors such as the 4670K and the 4770K. Uh, so we're essentially going to be giving you a quick kind of um, tutorial on how to quickly look at your CPU, the motherboard that you're going to be running, your ASUS board, going into the UE and how to achieve things manually. Uh, right now for you guys that want a more simplified way of being able to easily overclock your system and you're not interested in doing a manual oriented overclock, make sure and check out our four-way optimization video where we go into showing you how we can automatically overclock your system and have it be specific to your CPU, your cooling, your power supply, your memory and, and, and achieve some very impressive results. Uh, for you guys that are way more interested in doing things from a manual perspective inside of the UEFI or what some people are still calling the BIOS, make sure to keep it locked here to this video. We're going to break it down for you and give you guys all the insights on how to successfully overclock your uh, 4670K or 4770K. Okay guys, so we've gone ahead and entered into our UEFI here on our Maximus 6 Hero. Now keep in mind that for you guys that might be uh, trying this attempt on an ASUS C87 series motherboard that is not ROG, so whether it's uh, one of our channel series or gold series motherboards, uh, Sabertooth series or WS series, all the same values that I'm going to be discussing are 100% the same, but before you start any overclocking endeavor, 100% please make sure to go to support.asus.com and download the latest UEFI, aka BIOS, for your motherboard and update it prior to starting your overclocking endeavors. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and start on this. So, first off right here in the top hand left hand corner, you're going to see that there's actually what we have a, a target uh, system and what the target system is essentially is kind of an integrated calculator that will display to you the frequencies that you're going to attempt to be pursuing real time and these will be linked into different options that you're going to go ahead and be adjusting. And we'll show you actually how this comes into play once we start to make some of these adjustments. Now the first setting that we're going to go ahead and attempt to go ahead and adjust is going to be AI overclock tuner. Very simple is we're going to have two options, one is going to be manual or XMP. Um, for right now, we're going to go ahead and set it uh, to manual. Now keep in mind that XMP does load a predefined memory table that includes frequency, timings, and voltage for the memory kit that you have. And in no most normal situations, when we overclock our CPU, we're probably also going to at least apply the XMP uh, value for our memory. But we're going to talk a little bit about how that may affect your overclock. So as of right now, we're not going to do that. That's going to be the first option that we adjust. From there, uh, your next option is going to be right here that's going to be called the CPU core ratio or this is sometimes what's referred to as the multiplier for the CPU. There's going to be two options that we're going to have, one being a sync all cores uh, and that essentially means that the frequency that we're going to attempt to pursue is going to be the same across all cores. So if you define 46, that would be 4.6 gigahertz versus the baseline frequency of 3.5 gigahertz. Now if we go back up and we check here, you can see now that my new CPU target speed is 4.6 gigahertz. So that's shown to us real time in terms of that adjustment being made. Now, in some situations, it may actually be more sensible to use actually a per-core tuning method. What per-core would allow you to do is actually run, let's say, maybe one and two cores at a higher value versus running three and four cores. Not all CPUs have the ability to run uh, high frequency core, uh, high frequencies across all cores. So an example of that may be maybe your CPU isn't capable of running 4.7 gigahertz um, on all four, but can run it on one and two. So you could define 47 on, let's say, these two cores and then on three and four cores, you could define 46. Uh, so this is actually a more efficient and effective way in terms of maximizing your total possible overclocking headroom. Uh, but for simplicity, uh, we're just gonna go ahead and maintain with a sync core policy. So let's go ahead and go back to 46 as being our baseline. Now the initial values that I'm gonna go ahead and show you, this is a quick and easy way that at least with a good quality high performance cooling solution, you can go ahead and attempt to enter in these values and check on the initial quality of your CPU. Most CPUs uh, right off the bat are going to be looking at about a 44 to 45 X or 4.4 to 4.5 uh, gigahertz uh, realistic range in terms of uh, the, the frequency that can be achieved with varying levels of voltage. Now we'll talk a little bit more about voltage in a second. Uh, right below that we're going to have another value that's going to call the CPU cache ratio. Now for you guys that don't even want to mess about this value, it's entirely okay. You can just 100% keep it at auto. Um, but for you guys that want to be able to maximize 100% best performance, uh, instead of using our optimized what's called auto rule, which means the board will try to auto negotiate the best value for the easiest and smoothest overclocking, you can try to maximize the performance by setting uh, your actual 
uh, core, excuse me, your core ratio. Um, now, the core ratio is similar in the past to what was called a kind of uncore. Uh, this is technically what's called the ring bus, and this links in a lot of the um, memory interaction and system bus communication between the CPU and the motherboard, and, and it's one of the key parts of the architecture. Um, the closer that you run the cache ratio to the same frequency as your CPU, the faster your total system will be. So ideally you want to run a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning if I define 46 as my multiplier, I want to run 46 as my cache ratio. Many CPUs will not be able to hold a native cache ratio. This is why we recommend just go ahead and do 39, excuse me, uh, a very low value like 39 or 40, or just allow the motherboard to define it automatically for you. Um, so for right now, we're just gonna go ahead and define auto. Um, also keep in mind that the cache ratio, you may be able to go ahead and adjust this um, to a lower value if you're attempting to go to a higher level multiplier and you haven't been successful at being able to reach that multiplier even with increases in voltage. Uh, so let's go ahead and go down to our next option, which is going to be the DRAM frequency. Uh, for the DRAM frequency, in most situations, you won't need to set this because when you set your XMP value, it will automatically set your memory. So as right now, we don't know, we need to go ahead and worry about this value. So next up from there, we're pretty much almost done. Uh, we're just gonna be talking a little bit about voltage here. So you're gonna have a couple of different uh, voltages. So I'm just gonna quickly clarify and give you some perspective. Manual mode is a fixed voltage. It means that regardless of whether the CPU is in an idle state or whether it's actually at a full load state, um, it's gonna always run the same exact voltage. It's very inefficient. So if the CPU, of course, frequency is coming down, that means the voltage is not coming down. Um, a newer voltage option is going to be the adaptive voltage option. The great thing about adaptive voltage is that when the CPU is at an idle state and the frequency has come down, the voltage also comes down. But when your CPU frequency goes up to your overclocked level, it will also increase the actual voltage as well. So this gives us the kind of the best thermal characteristics, the best power consumption, and the overall the most efficient overclock. So adaptive would be my recommendation. Keep in mind though for you guys that like to run synthetic stress tests, you're not going to want to use an adaptive voltage because it will incur a significantly higher voltage on top of whatever you define. So uh, we don't recommend the use of any type of synthetic type of stress test programs like Prime95, Lynx, Intel burn tests because they're not validated and tested. Um, but if you are gonna use some type of application like that, you're gonna to wanna to use a manual vid instead, but you're gonna compromise on your efficiency. So we're just gonna go ahead and select an adaptive vid, and we're gonna dial in a voltage. Now for you guys, remember we talked about an initial baseline of something that would be easy. If you remember, all we've done is set 46, sync all cores, and 1.2, that's it. If your CPU can do 46 at 1.2 post, and boot into the operating system, as well as run a gamut of stability testing, you've actually got a very good quality CPU. If it requires less than this and the CPU can't effectively get into the operating system, you may need to continue to increase the voltage until you can successfully accomplish not only a post, a boot, but your stability testing. We'll talk a little bit about stability testing at the very end, but right now I'm gonna give you guys a quick example of whether uh, to show you if the system would actually be able to get into the operating system. Um, as my CPU can actually do 4.6 at 1.2 without any issues, I'm gonna actually go to a lower level of voltage. So I'm gonna go to 1.125 just as an example uh, for the voltage that I've gone ahead and defined and I haven't made any other changes. So with that, let's just go ahead and save and show you an example of this. Now keep in mind that when you define an actual overclocked frequency, when the CPU is actually not in the OS environment, it doesn't work at that actual frequency. It only works under that frequency once you've gotten into an actual operating system layer and when there's load that's detected. Um, that's why generally a crash usually occurs when the Windows loading policy is starting to occur. So if like you're under Windows 7, that's when the balls are forming, or on Windows 8, it would be something like this. Um, now sometimes the crash might not occur until maybe you get right towards the desktop. So an example might be here. You can see right there, right as I was entering into the OS layer and that frequency was getting initialized, there was too little voltage and the system crashed. So that let us know, hey, I need to apply more voltage to the system. So that's just an example of that. So right now we're just gonna quickly restart the system, get back into our actual UEFI so that I can uh, go ahead and reset back to defaults and complete showing you guys the rest of the values to consider. Okay guys, we've gone ahead and re-entered back inside of the UEFI and we've defined our additional turbo voltage as being 1.2, which is what I recommended as our test voltage to try at. From here, there's one optional voltage that you may have, which is this CPU analog IO offset voltage. Um, this is gonna be something that you could attempt to go ahead and adjust in certain situations where if you apply your XMP level that you may see 
uh, that the CPU at a higher frequency with a high DRAM frequency might not successfully be able to post boot or be able to maintain stability under stress tests. Uh, what we've noticed for this platform is that there is some variability at being able to run high fr a memory frequency with high CPU frequency. Uh, if you're going to be running something like a 4.4, 4.5, 4.6 plus gigahertz uh, with 1600 enabled memory, you should generally be okay. But for you guys considering more aggressive memory overclocks such as uh, uh, eight, greater than 1866, so 2133, 2400, 2600 and greater speeds, keep in mind that the CPU may not be able to actually run at those frequencies due to variability in the memory controller. Our, um, our motherboards though, 100% are fully capable. We've done testing with even full four DIMM, 2800 DIMMs without any issues. Um, but if you wanted to attempt to try to see if you can maybe push the board, push the CPU to be able to get uh, that higher memory frequency with the higher CPU, you can try to increase this voltage um, to work at somewhere between 1.150 to as much as about two point, about yeah, about 2.0 uh, in terms of the, the voltage. But keep in mind that more is not better here. Every CPU characteristic will be a little bit different in terms of the amount of voltage that it might require for this type of uh, voltage uh, that can help to improve the DRAM scaling. Uh, so this is an option that you can go ahead and adjust, but in most situations we would advise auto. So with that, uh, you can see here we have our 46, we have 1.2, and we're just gonna go ahead and enable XMP so that we can go ahead and take advantage of our Mushkin Redline 2400 memory. So now that gives us a new target value of 4.6 with uh, 2400 base memory, and that's all the values that I need you to adjust. Everything else the motherboard is gonna automatically take care of. So from here, I'm just gonna show you quickly that uh, this successfully boots into our OS environment, and then from there, I'm gonna show you some quick plug and play values so you can attempt a 4.8 gigahertz overclock. Okay guys, so you can see right here, we've entered in our operating system. That error only came up from the previous unsuccessful attempt where we showed you the lower voltage. At this point, of course, we could start some other options in terms of stability testing, but we're gonna show that at our 4.8 gigahertz overclock. So with that, we're just gonna go ahead and reboot back inside of the UEFI, uh, just to guys give you a baseline on how to be able to target the 4.8 gigahertz overclock. So overall, uh, really one of the key attributes is if you notice, we made very, very little changes overall to most of the motherboard parameters. Really all we defined was the multiplier, our memory divider, and the voltage that we wanted for the CPU. Otherwise, we allowed the actual motherboard to define all the other values, and that's one thing that we've worked on extensively to make this process very easy and simple for you to work on. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and maintain the XMP, but keep in mind that for you guys, when you're first testing this, I would advise doing all your overclocking without setting any increase on memory. So trying to just do 4.6 by itself at the minimum memory divider, just to ensure that your CPU can reach that frequency without any issues before attempting to reach it with the CPU frequency and the DRAM frequency at a higher level. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and set 48 to our core ratio, and we're gonna go ahead and increase the voltage here uh, for what we're gonna target at 1.28 uh, or 1.275. If your CPU can hit 4.8 at that effective voltage ceiling, you're doing great and you've got a really nice quality CPU. Now keep in mind though that we've seen a variation amongst CPUs to a very high degree in terms of the frequency and the voltage. An example is we have 4.6 gigahertz processors that need as little voltage as 1.150 and as much as 1.40, so a big range. Um, we're gonna go ahead and, like I said, do the 1.280. Lastly, for you guys that might be just wondering about voltages, uh, we've overall feel that a 1.275 to 1.28 voltage range is what's gonna be best realized uh, for the majority of you users out there in terms of what can be effectively dissipated by high-performance heatsink. If you're not interested in doing synthetic stress testing and only real-world applications like gaming, you can definitely increase that level of voltage without any issues and still have very, very low operating system temperatures. So uh, we've done the 1.28, 48 here in terms of our multiplier and the XMP gives us 48 to 2400 and we're going to go ahead and now reboot into our OS. And once again, guys, remember, if you see a crash that's generally occurring right around here in terms of the Windows loading policy, it's usually an indicator that the voltage level that you've defined for the CPU is too low for the frequency level that you've attempted to reach, or of course that the CPU may just not be able to run at that effective uh, multiplier or that frequency you're trying. So now that we've gotten into the desktop, uh, we're gonna go ahead and just open up an actual application to verify our CPU frequency. 
and uh, we've gone ahead and selected A64 because it's elevated by, uh, it's, excuse me, it's uh, evaluated and tested and verified by ASUS as well as uh, Intel. And we can see that uh, our actual voltage has dropped down as well as our CPU frequency because now we're only doing a very light, moderate level of usage. But if we were to go ahead and open up an application and actually stress test it, uh, we're going to actually have an increase to the 4.8 gigahertz. There you can see though that we have reached our 2400 effective speed. So from here, we're just gonna go ahead and let's say uh, run something like Cinebench as a, as a reference example in terms of, of our overclock. We don't need to worry about OpenGL and we're just gonna go ahead and run the selected test. And from there, you can see right there that we've got 4.8 gigahertz at 2400 and the voltage has gone ahead and moved up to uh, the defined voltage of about 1.280. And now uh, for you guys that are wondering about load, uh, load line calibration from previous generations, don't worry about it. Under this platform, there is no worries to be able to make any adjustments whatsoever to load line calibration or any of the other power management options. If you guys are interested in more extensive information, uh, feel free to check out uh, a link that we'll provide to you to our more extensive overclocking guide for more specifics on a lot of the power management options that we have inside the UEFI. But for most of you guys, this is pretty much all you're gonna need to be able to successfully overclock your system. Um, now lastly, people always ask about how do you stress test your CPU. There are different options. Um, you know, my personal recommendation would be for real world applications, use what you're actually going to run in your system, whether that's going to be Photoshop, whether that's going to be a web browser, whether that's going to be games, use what you're running. If you want to run something more stressful, I do recommend ADA64 and their stability tests, but keep in mind that if you're going to be running an adaptive voltage, this will incur higher voltage than you've defined. So I would only recommend running the stability test under the manual vid level. Otherwise, use real world applications like performance Performance pass mark, uh, performance test, or pa perf uh, excuse me, um, pass marks burn and test. Uh, for a third option, there's another great program that you guys will have available to you, and that's going to be. Uh, something that we're going to be releasing to the community that is called ROG Real Bench. Uh, ROG Real Bench will allow you to actually run this on your system and stress test it in a number of ways with real world applications such as Handbrake, GIMP, and a number of other programs that will all real world tax your system to a very high degree, uh, but also be able to give you a perspective at whether your system is improved in performance, and this is key. If you can, try to run any of these performance benchmarks at stock and then also when overclocked. So here, if we just, for example, we start off to it, you're gonna see that actually the program will open up and it will begin, uh, it will begin other, uh, excuse me, it will be, it begin benchmarks to go ahead and show us uh, some stress testing of the CPU. So right here, we're gonna begin the image editor and this will actually start GIMP and this will start a, a number of different edits that are going to be occurring and would stress the CPU and allow us to get a baseline to see if our system is stable. So overall, that gives you guys some perspective relative to overclocking a 4770K as well as a 4670K. Every single option that I defined for you would be 100% the same on a 4670K as well as once again on any one of our Z87 series motherboards. So with that, let's go ahead and wrap things up. Okay guys, so uh, hopefully you guys have learned how to successfully overclock your 4770K or 4670K on an ASUS Z87 series motherboard. We've gone ahead and broke it down to you pretty quickly and effectively of how you can accomplish that inside of our UEFI. It's very simple. If you notice, very few amount of steps that actually are required to be able to go ahead and achieve successful overclocking endeavors uh, with these processors on our series of motherboards. As always, if you guys have any questions, comments, feedback, we'd love to see them here on the page in the comments section or feel free to also go ahead and email me. Uh, or you can go ahead and also hit us, hit us up on our ASUS North American Facebook pages, our ASUS North American uh, Twitter pages, and leave us some commentary there as well. If you enjoy the video, please make sure and subscribe and thumbs up, like the video, uh, so we can keep the content coming out to you. And as always, thank you for watching.